As a church, we've been moving methodically through the missionary journeys of Acts, so we will be there today if you like to pre-turn Acts 13. As a reminder, Acts is short for Acts of the Apostles, in case you wondered what those actions are. Uh, This is sort of a highlight reel written by Luke, that's the author, and it really covers about 30 years of church history. Last week we saw Barnabas, Saul, and John Mark board a boat and go to a small island of Cyprus, preach the gospel, and run right into a sorcerer named Bar Jesus. There we go. That was quiz. I knew. I knew the answer. Um, and so they uh, try to derail the apostles in their work, but Saul, full of the Spirit, denounces and blinds this sorcerer, and uh, they finish their task. They board another boat. They go to the mainland. So if you're kind of picturing your Mediterranean Sea in in your mind, you have the island of Cyprus just off the coast, and then they're going to go north to sort of that area Paul would call Galatia. So they're going back to the mainland. Uh, They they take a journey, really. The, The text doesn't say how difficult this journey would be, but between the lines... Um, to go from where they went to uh, our journey today, they would have had to cross the Taurus mountain range, which is a pretty serious journey. Uh, That would be like if I said, you know, I I walked from Denver, Colorado to Salt Lake City, Utah. And you would be like, wait wait a minute. You mean you walked over the Rocky Mountains? Yeah, I just left that part out. Yeah, that's that's what's in the text there when they say where uh, Paul and Barnabas walked to. They didn't really say that they covered the mountain range, but they had to to get there. And so they settle in a little town in Antioch of Pisidia. Again, Antioch was a common name in those days. So this is not the Antioch church that sent them. There are multiple Antiochs because Antiochus was a ruler that uh, a lot of cities were named after him. So they're up here in this city called Antioch of Pisidia, and they find a cluster of Jewish synagogues, and they decide to go preach there. Um, again, historically, the Jews were not just in Israel. Through all of their captivities and all of the political resettlements that took place, their people were scattered throughout the land. And if you want a $2 seminary word today, that is called the diaspora Jew, okay? So there you go. You learned something today. So today's message will pick up with Paul going to the Pisidian Jew- Jews at Antioch. And uh, in case you ever wondered what was said, what Paul says when it says, and he would first go to the synagogues and preach. Well, today, the veil is pulled back, and we get to hear exactly what a Paul sermon to the Jewish synagogues would have been like. In these missionary journeys, you see Paul would often have sort of two versions of his sermons. He would have the one that was uh, a biblical-minded audience, so an audience that, that knew the background of the Old Testament and the Scriptures, and he would sort of preach that way. And then he had those that were absolute pagans, never heard of Yahweh, never learned of, they don't know who Abraham is, David, none of that. And so he sort of had these two versions that he would give. And the punchline was always Jesus, and the gospel was the punchline. But he would have used two different approaches. So today is going to be the approach where you know the biblical background. You know those big names, the patriarchs and the kings of Israel. And perhaps in your life, You know somebody who grew up in a faithful church. You know someone who went to kids' ministry and and youth ministry, and you know that they know the stories of the Bible. They're exposed to truth, but for whatever reason, now they've walked away. They're not uh, attending a church. You don't see any fruit in their life. How many of you guys know somebody like that? I know that that they know, but today they act like they don't know, all right? So uh, we all know people like that. This is a message that I hope helps in that scenario, uh, someone that has a background. Uh, hopefully this message helps as we preach the gospel in our lives To There are other faiths and religions that, that do have some of the information that we have. Um, Catholics, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, even Muslims. Uh, while obviously they differ in gr- great degree of our disagreement, uh, but they still know who Abraham is, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Adam, David, Solomon, they know those names. So there's something there. Um, And I hope that even today's message will help you with those in your life, those people who you seek to reach out to, where you don't necessarily have to convince them that there is a God. It's just, which God? So 
how would Paul present Christ to someone with a biblical background? Today we're going to see Paul's main argument to this crowd with a biblical background is that Jesus indeed has come as the Messiah and Savior of the world, but not as a new kid on the block. Okay, that's important. Not as a random revolutionary, not coming to upend or contradict everything that God and the Jews had been doing for millennia. He was not a spiritual guru that had a new vision and sought to create his own religion from scratch. He was not the Buddha dissatisfied with Hinduism, so he split off and did his own thing. He was not Muhammad dissatisfied with Judaism and Christianity, so he split off and did his own thing. Rather, Jesus is the, here's the key word, fulfillment of a long history of God's kept promises to his people. A fulfillment of God's faithfulness to his people, as well as his demonstrated grace to his people over and over, consistently revealed in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament. Do you know that the Old Testament is the bedrock of our New Testament Christian faith? It was the Bible that Jesus and the apostles believed and preached. It is not prehistory. It is not an inconvenience to Christianity. It is Christianity. And furthermore, any church, this is for free, any church or pastor that throws shade upon the Old Testament and acts as if it's an inconvenience, you ought to run for the hills. Don't be a, you ought not to be a part of a church like that. If you can't remember the last time they talked about the Old Testament, you better be very afraid. What are you teaching in Sunday school, Ted? Isaiah. Isaiah, that's right. Just checking. Okay. I want to enjoy Jesus today as the fulfillment of God's promises. I want you to worship God. I want you to actually worship God in your heart and mind as you sit there for his consistency and faithfulness as he sent Christ to forgive his people, made, uh, kept his made promises, and in Christ, all of those promises received their yes and their amen in him. Let's begin by a word of prayer, then we'll look at the word. Our Father, our God today, we look at a sermon that has already been preached in history, Lord, but I, I feel that you would have it be preached again to our hearts today. Lord, your word is, it was alive then and it's alive today. So Lord, would you take it, shape and mold us, Lord, find those places where we've yet to yield ourselves to you, break those walls down, draw us to yourself, and Lord, may someone call on the name of Jesus even today, I pray in your name, amen. I'm going to tell you something. This is off script a little bit. A pet peeve that I've got. I feel like in our culture, we have gotten to the point, as a, I, this is as a preacher, where I'm afraid to preach long passages of scripture because of the attention span of the audiences. All right? Now, I'm going to tell you, that's not good, right? We have to, at some point, be able to train our, ourselves to hear and digest large passages of written text, okay? Uh, that sounds like an old guy right now. That's okay. If you, my thought is, some of y'all have read all the Harry Potter books and all the Lord of the Rings books and all that stuff, and it's no big deal. We're talking about like 30, 40 verses today. I believe, by God's grace, we can handle it. I really do, that we can be engaged throughout it. So um, that's it. that was just for free again. All right, now, we're going to look at the intro, Acts 13, 13, and our first section is going to run through 16, then we'll pause. Now... Paul and his companions, real quick, notice it's Paul and his companions. It was Barnabas and Saul before. And uh, something happened where all of a sudden they started identifying that troop as Paul and company, right? At first it was Barnabas and Saul, now it's Paul and company. Could have been the blinded magician. All right, now, Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. That's, That's a foreshadowing statement for a future sermon, okay? Put a little check mark right there. But... They went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia, different Antioch. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. And Paul said, as a matter of fact, I do, cubby. No, he said, motioning with his hand, he stood up and we'll pause right there. Before Paul launches into the sermon, let's stop. He mentioned the travel. Uh, We already talked about the travel, but notice we get a little glimpse into that synagogue system. So we see what they were doing. They had a a reading 
plan, kind of like a Bible reading plan that you're used to, where in the synagogues they would read uh, the law of Moses. When they say law, they, they often would mean the first five books, the Torah, and uh, then they would have a time of teaching, and then they would read from the prophets, and they would sort of have their specific walk-through plan so they would cover the Bible in a certain amount of time. And there would be an open invitation often for a visitor from the floor to do sort of an open mic moment. Now, there must be, they must be more trusting than me. Because let me just tell you, I'm not feeling that that would ever happen here. Anybody in the crowd got a word from the Lord? Like, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> I've been burned one too many times for that one. So um, anyway, that, that's what happened though. And this must, it was probably a smaller group, but they um, probably recognized Paul. I mean, you think about who he was. If you, were, if you were a diaspora Jew, hundreds of miles north, and you get the Pharisee from Israel, who sat at the feet of Gamaliel. I mean, th- you, would let, you would almost turn the, the thing over to him in the beginning and say, teach us, Rabbi. And that's exactly what they did. And guess what? Paul took the opportunity. He took it. So I want you to think about in this situation, uh, just put yourself in this situation, all right? I know you're thinking, I'm not Paul, I'm not a Pharisee, I'm not a Jew, I'm any of that. I'm not a good preacher, any of that. But what would you do in this moment if, let's say, the mic was given to you and, it, and you were sitting in a room full of Jews who had never heard the gospel, didn't know who Jesus was, but you met Jesus a couple, a couple decades ago back down south, and you know the gospel now, but they've never heard it. It's just news to them. And someone gave you the mic and said, would you like to speak today? What would you say? What would you formulate? How would you start? Four score and seven years ago? No. I was thinking about some, uh, a lot of the politics stuff going on in our, in our nation, and, and don't worry, I'm not going to go into that, but I was looking at sort of the campaigning going on, and something I noticed that typically there's a different campaign strategy with the incumbent president and the challenging president. Uh, so the incumbent usually tries to convince you that all the campaign promises he made before, he kept. If he can do that, it turns out pretty well for him. All the, things I'm, all the promises I made when I was campaigning, I did all of those things. And I'll do it again. And that's the challenge. And the other guy or gal has to say, uh, I have an alternate vision for this country, and it's better than what this guy's pitching. So they do it like that. I want you to see today, as Paul stands up before this synagogue, he is essentially preaching as the incumbent. All right? He is treating them as if uh, they've already, God is already their king. They already believe in God. So he's going to convince them that the promises God has made were kept. And there's one more big promise that they don't even know God kept that he's going to tell them about. So the first point today is we look at the proclamation of the gospel to those familiar with the scriptures. Number one, you, you need to present a foundation of faithfulness. A foundation of faithfulness. If you're an outline guesser, yeah, they're F's today. All right, so we're going to read Acts 13, starting in 16 and go through 23 for the next chunk. Acts 13, 16. So here's the sermon. Point one. Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. You're getting a good history lesson. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David the son of Jesse a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought a savior to Israel, Jesus, as he promised. Okay, so you can see here, Paul is leaning on the faithful provision of God as his theme. And sometimes it's good to stop and think. Have you ever stopped and thought, Everything I have in my life is because God gave it to me. Sometimes you got to think like that. Even though I'm often my own, my own worst enemy, I sin, I slip into failure, God is still there pursuing me. He is still following after me and, and, and lifting me up even when I'm in the pit. That is a faithful God. Even when we wander, he stands firm in faithfulness to us. We break our end of the bargain often, and he stands resolute in his. 
His promises are sure and certain. As I was reading this opening portion of Paul's sermon, I couldn't help but notice the way that Paul just attributed everything to God's provision. Perhaps as I read these, I'm going to run back through these, maybe with a little uh, outline you can, you can see. Run your eyes back over your, your Bible and look for the action words that God did. It's like the whole thing. Verse 17, who chose our fathers? They got together and had a meeting. No, God chose our fathers. Verse 17, remember that Abram didn't say to God uh, in, in Genesis 12, it wasn't Abraham said to God, get up and go. God said to Abram, get up and go. God identified the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as his chosen and treasured people. And if you are in Christ today, guess what? God chose and treasured you out of all peoples of the earth as well. As the Lord said to Israel in Deuteronomy 7, 7, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping his oath that he swore to your fathers. That's why God loved his people. Verse 17, the Lord made them great in Egypt. If you remember the problem with the Israelite slaves, it wasn't that they were an unruly bunch, it was that they had a bunch of babies They were outnumbering the people that were holding them in slavery. And we know from Scripture that God did that. He was building them up even in their slavery to make them great because he knew that their freedom was coming. Verse 17 says, With an uplifted arm, who led them out of Egypt? Moses? The Lord led them out of Egypt. Through the raising up of Moses and Aaron to the ten plagues, to the standing up of the waters and the the two walls walking through the middle, the uplifted arm of God refers to, man, God just showing off. God was displaying his might and his power in releasing his people from bondage. Verse 18 says, he put up with them in the wilderness. Now, this is an interesting textual note for the, uh, for the one or two Hebrew scholars in the audience. Uh, the language of Hebrew between God put up with them, as in he endured them, versus God carried them, is like one letter off in the word. It's very similar. So the manuscripts are actually somewhat divided on, and maybe you even have a footnote in your Bible that says that God carried him. I don't know which one is the better option, but I can say this. God puts up with our sin and our weakness, doesn't he? And at the same time, he's carrying us to the next day. So both of those are pretty much true. Verse 19, God destroyed the seven nations. Remember the Hizites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and all the ites, right? This refers to all those battles, the conquest for the land, and even though the humans were slinging the swords, and even though the, the, the men were holding the shields in their hands, it was God that was giving them the victory in battle. God cleared out the land of its inhabitants and gave his land to his promised people. Verse 20, God gave them judges, all right? These judges didn't come out of thin air. God raised them up. Now, if you read Judges, you'll know that they often slipped into sin. It was a downward, downward spiral of sin over and over and over again. And God would show up, raise up a judge, and he would get them out of the captivity that had befallen their tribes. Verse 21, God gave them Saul as king. Now, this is a good reminder. Sometimes God gives you what you ask for, and it's a teachable moment, right? Saul was the tall, dark, and handsome, popular choice of Israel. You know, Randy, how it is. They begged God to forgive Saul. Uh, They begged God to give them Saul instead of Samuel. God, we we don't want Samuel the prophet. We want the tall, beautiful man. Give us Saul. And so God said, okay. And in verse 22, we are told that God removed Saul. Verse 22 also says that God raised up David. This was God's choice for king over Israel. He finalized the conquest. He was a man after God's own heart. Certainly not a sinless man. Certainly not a perfect king. But David did show Uh, love towards his Lord. He served him with a whole heart. And guess what? There was never idolatry in Israel during David's reign. God's people had been built. I hope you see in all that time that we just looked at, God's people were built upon a foundation of faithfulness. Everything they had was given to them by God. God poured out his love and grace upon his people year after year after year. And this was the backdrop that Paul wanted in their mind as he was about to make a case for Christ. Their history was a history of provision and kept promises. God made promises to Abraham about a land and a nation, and guess what? They got it. Even when his people strayed to uphold their end of the deal, God still came through, and God still kept his word. Even when the people begged for a Saul constantly, God showed up with a David. 
Even when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and sewed together their fig leaves of shame, God still showed up with the clothing of animal skins that he made to cover them in their nakedness. And as far as Paul's audience that day, there would have been nodding along. They would have been amening along, just like you probably are, with a puffed out chest, maybe a lone patriotic tear in the eye as they, as they did that. Up until about verse 23, right? Of this man's offspring, God brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Now, I wasn't there, but there was probably an eyebrow or two that went up in the room. Hmm? What? They had never heard of Jesus. That wasn't a normal name of a savior in their Bible. Now, perhaps this Jewish community was going to give Paul the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they knew, hey, we're up north. We're really, this could have, something could have happened down in Israel that we didn't know about. I mean, we don't, didn't, couldn't email them and see what was going on. So they were willing to listen. They didn't stop. They didn't scream. They didn't uh, do like they did with Stephen and, and grit their teeth and plug their ears and throw rocks. Like they still, they stood in there and they listened. So Paul was essentially saying, there's another chapter of the Bible that you guys don't know about. The same God who provided for us, and Paul could say us, through all of our history, did it again. Except here's his biggest fulfilled promise. We have seen Paul proclaim a foundation of faithfulness. That's number one. Now number two, a fulfillment of faith. A fulfillment of faith. We're going to go back to our text. Look at Acts thirteen twenty six. We're going to read through 33. All right, so he's turning away from the historical part Getting a little application here. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him, nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. So what's the message here? What's the single takeaway from that portion? Paul is telling this Jewish community near Galatia, well, the Messiah actually came. But here's the thing. We sort of missed it. Uh, We didn't really understand what was happening because we misinterpreted the prophets. So we sort of killed the Messiah down in Jerusalem. The Savior of the world, we did that. Uh, But here's some good news. Some good news. Our God is so wise and so powerful, and his ways are so much higher than our ways, he actually factored in our opposition into the prophecies. So we, we actually fulfilled prophecies in killing Jesus. So in a weird way, we we kind of helped Jesus get to the cross and be the savior of the world by killing him there on the cross. And then Paul transitions to the resurrection. God raised Jesus from the dead. Lots of people saw him alive. The Messiah came, died, is alive today. He was a Jewish guy named Jesus. We saw him. And so I got on a boat, crossed a mountain, cut down some weeds with my machete, and I'm here to tell you about it. All right, That's how he, he finished it. So I want to focus on verse 32 and 33 because that's really the key. For me, that was really the key of this entire message. And we bring you the good news, listen, that what God promised, this he has fulfilled. What God promised, he has fulfilled. You might want to underline that. The question is, what was fulfilled? That's really the question left on the table. What was fulfilled in Christ when he was raised up? Between verse 33, 34, and 35, you're going to see some sprinkles of prophecies, some words from the Old Testament, quotations, well-known statements on David, okay? 
So he, he ended his soliloquy there with David, and so that's the camp out point where Paul is going to expand some thoughts on David that he hoped would trigger this Jewish mind. This was his, this was his uh, get to the gospel springboard, okay? He used David. So first of all, you need to know there was a covenant made by God to David, and if you don't know where that is, it's in 2 Samuel 7. It's called the Davidic Covenant. Really important. They used it a lot in the New Testament. In this covenant, God said through David he would establish an everlasting kingdom, and from his line will come one who will sit on the throne forever. That was the, that was the covenant. That's the Davidic covenant. And there was an understanding God would, Psalm 2, somehow relate to the Messiah as a son. There was an understanding the Messiah would not undergo physical decay in his body. That's Psalm 16, 11. Uh, and he would not die and rot in the ground. Okay, so Paul says, brothers, if this is what you're looking for, all right, that's what we're talking about. We're looking for that guy. Look no further. Look at verses 36 and 37. For David, after he served the purpose of God in his own generation and fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption, but he whom God raised up did not see corruption. All right, what's he saying? What's the point of this? Paul is saying, as great as David was, probably the greatest king of Israel, he died. The great king died. David died and his body decomposed, let's get real, and rotted in the ground, just like every other person who's going to die. But Jesus' body did not decompose and rot in the ground. In fact, he's still alive today and he looked better after the fact. Jesus is the one raised up from the line of David who will sit on the throne of Israel forever. He is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. He is the one who receives the sure blessings of David. Kramer, I did not give you that verse today, right? I, you, you picked that verse on your own. The sure blessings of David in his an everlasting covenant. God's moving here, y'all. I'm just saying, that's pretty cool. Jesus is the holy one who never saw corruption. He is the fulfillment of the greatest promise ever made to mankind that a redeemer would come from the seed of woman and who would stomp the head of the serpent. In Jesus, the faith of God's people became sight. Every Old Testament promise finds the yes and amen in Christ. Jesus was the great promised redeemer in the garden. Where Adam failed in representing all people, Jesus succeeded in representing all people for righteousness sake. Jesus is the true and better sacrifice given by Abel, a picture of shed blood rather than man's efforts grown in the toil of the ground. Jesus is the true and better ark built by Noah, who shields us from the judgment of God as we take refuge in him. Jesus is the true and better Abraham, the man of faith who trusted God even when the marching orders were difficult. Jesus is the true and better ram caught in the thicket as the hand of Abraham was stopped by the angel and Jehovah Jireh, God provided a substitute sacrifice. Just look over to the side. Jesus is the true and better Joseph who was betrayed by his own people but through God's providence secured salvation for the very ones who scorned him. Jesus is the true and better Moses who delivers us from our bondage and stands between us and God as a mediator. Jesus is the true and better Joshua who goes before us and fights our battles, seemingly unbeatable battles that we face in our life. Jesus is the true and better high priest of Israel who needs no sin offering for himself. He walks into the Holy of Holies and he splits the curtain down the middle, allowing us an unbroken access to Yahweh and says, call him Father. Jesus is the true and better David, the true king of Israel and the head of the church. He sits enthroned in heaven, and will one day bring that throne down to earth and meld the two together. Jesus is the true and better prophet of Israel. The greatest prophet to ever live, we're told, was John the Baptist, a picture of Elijah. And even John said, I am not worthy to stoop down and untie Jesus' sandal. He fulfilled the law and prophets in his sinless life and in his prophetic death, Paul doesn't say to the Jews even that he died on a cross. Do you find that interesting? In that, he says he was on a tree. Now, why would Paul say that? It's because to the Jewish mind, Deuteronomy says that cursed is anyone who is hung on a tree. Paul was telling them that Jesus not only died, 
but he bore the curse of God, the wrath of God, so that we would not have to endure God's wrath. Everything about Jesus was a fulfillment, a yes and amen, a promise made by the Father and kept by the Son. God had faithfully provided for his people, and Paul was here to say that his provision had not stopped, and that the greatest provision had come, and he had seen it. Jesus, the Messiah, had come. There was a foundation of faithfulness. There was a fulfillment of faith. And lastly, Paul proclaims the gospel, and he presents number three, a fiat of forgiveness. It's okay to like that word. Yeah, I used a thesaurus. It's okay. Now, I'm not talking about a small Italian car. A fiat is a declaration. It is a proclamation. It is an edict of authority. We often say dictators rule by fiat. They just speak a command, and it just becomes law as they speak it. We see Paul give a declaration here, but it's not bad news. It is very good news. Look at verse 38 and 39. Paul says, Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers... That through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. That's what you call good news. It's important to note that um, the Greek word that Paul chose for in verse 39 for freed is the same word he often used in Romans for the word justified. If you studied Romans, you know what that means. It means to declare righteous. It's a declared righteousness. Theologian R.C. Sproul would often say that our justification is an alien righteousness. It's something that must be given to us from the outside because we don't have it and we can't make it. Paul is taking this grand theological argument that Christ is the Messiah And asking the fundamental question that we have to ask anytime we hear a great truth like that, which is, okay, so what does it have to do with me? And you might say, okay, the Messiah came. Those those folks in the synagogue could, could respond like this. So the Messiah came. I didn't even know it. I kept living my life. Couldn't have been that big of a deal, right? The earth kept spinning, didn't it? The rooster kept crowing, right? What does it matter other than we need to update our hymnals and add Jesus in there? And Paul says, well, actually, it does matter because Jesus does something new. He does something different. And it matters deeply to your life and your eternity. He says, you know the law of Moses that you guys keep? You know the 613 commandments that are in there, the Torah? What do they do? What does the law do? And if you're being honest, you'd have to say, as you think about the stop sign out front, Think about the red light. They tell you that you have broken a law. That's what it does. You have to say the best a law can do is tell you that you've broken it. Perhaps it makes you less sinful if you keep it. So it is a restrainer of evil. It makes us not as bad as we could be if we follow it. But a law can never forgive you, can it? A law can never forgive you. It can never make you free and it can never forgive you. It can't add righteousness to you. It can tell you you're wrong. It can add a record of transgressions. That's what a criminal record is, a record of transgression. Paul says, Jesus has come to actually forgive your sins and shortcomings. All the times when you didn't live up to God's standards, Jesus took those sins onto his body, bore them on the cross, nailed them to the cross, and carried them away into his death. And when you believe upon his name for salvation, he imputes righteousness to your account. He just gives it to you. He downloads an external file to your hard drive called the righteousness of Christ. He declares you actually righteous based upon the merits of Christ's perfect life lived. He forgives you by fiat. See, it wasn't that bad. And so perhaps an astute Jew might say, But Paul, we already had this. It's called the sacrificial system. We had this. We slaughter bulls and goats according to rituals, and we atone for our sins that way. And of course, there could be two, probably more than that, responses to that. First, the problem with with that still remains. A bull, goat, or lamb can never add righteousness to your account. 
you can't get the righteousness off of that lamb and add it to your account. First of all, how much righteousness could a lamb accrue in its lifetime, all right? So anyway, that's not going to happen. And second, Jesus is the once and for all, the final atoning sacrifice to complete and replace the sacrificial system. There is no more need for a day of atonement when he has atoned for all of your days, right? Christian, do you know that the message still resonates even today for you, for a person in your life, still trying to earn God's love and favor by your behavior? Now, you probably are not trying to keep all 613 commandments of the Torah. Hadn't seen any curly sideburns in here, all right? And I'm sure if we had barbecue after the service, you, you would join, right? But we might call it something else. Be a good human. Be kind to one another. Leave the world a better place than you found it. Go to church on Sundays and tithe. Impress your Christian friends with your sweet prayers and your wonderful Bible answers. There's a hundred ways to say it, but at the end of the day, it's law-keeping. It's seeking to earn the approval of God by a righteousness that you have earned and that you have accrued. But the truth that Paul brought to this synagogue and that he brings to you today is that Christ offers actual forgiveness of your sins, a fresh start, a clean slate before a holy God. You know, in the great span of eternity after we breathe our last, there will be no difference between an atheist and a very religious person at the judgment seat of Christ. If you stand before Christ as an atheist, you will be judged on whether or not you have a perfect righteousness. And if you stand before God as a religious person, you will be judged on whether or not you have a perfect righteousness. Same story. One life thumbed their nose at God and the other trampled upon the grace of Christ. But the outcome is the exact same. You don't have enough. You do not have enough righteousness and you cannot earn enough. You can't find enough along the way. I want you to know today that you can be forgiven of your sins solely based upon your faith in Christ. And you can trust him as your Savior and your Lord. And if you were wondering how a sinner like you could ever be right with God, that's the starting place. You're in a great spot. Apart from Christ, you can't. Apart from Christ, you cannot be right with God. But with Christ, you can. You absolutely can have a right relationship with your creator who made you if you go through Jesus Christ in faith in him alone. And when you do come to Christ, you can know You can know that it is a long fulfillment, a string of provision and promises kept, constant pouring of grace to his people. Worship God today. I pray that we worship him for his consistency and his faithfulness to us because he continually gives and gives and gives and gives. Our God has given so much to people who scorn him and turn their back on him. And the greatest gift of all, Christ Jesus, who lived, died, was buried, was risen, so that we might receive forgiveness of sins and have an eternal life viewing the splendor of the face of God. Pray with me. I want to thank you for your generous gifts to Calvary Hills Baptist Church. Your giving allows us to continue doing the mission of God. Giving is not just giving money. It's a worship act unto the Lord. And so I want to thank you so much for your generosity. Our mission at Calvary Hills Baptist Church is that we boldly proclaim Christ and represent him in this world. I pray that you see that happening at our church in what we say and in what we do. 
Stay updated on all of our church info by following us on Facebook, on Instagram, our church YouTube page, our church website, and receive emails directly by enlisting in our email service at the bottom of our website homepage. God bless. Have a wonderful day. I pray that you worship the Lord this week and serve Him.